people as they come. I know that Bill has a really nice presentation for us today, so I don't want to um, take any time away from it. So welcome um, to Coffee with Bill. Um, William Wolf, Bill Wolf, um, is our 2021 um, Orem and Harriet Robinson Fellow for Contemporary Art and Community Engagement at the Art League of Ocean City this year. And we're so grateful to have this position that was endowed by um, Laura Jenkins in honor of her parents um, who are educators. And the purpose of the fellowship is really to bring something new into the Art League community and then also to bring the Art League community and connect um, with the university. And each year the fellows in the position put their own spin on it. And, and that's been a beautiful thing. And this is our third year now with this fellowship. And uh, we particularly um, enjoyed Bill's work just because it's so unique and different and something that we don't really have that um, knowledge base here about the um, sculpture and, and how it ties in. And, and, and you can see drawings on the screen there. So I'm really eager to hear from Bill's our first session of the year with him. And I hope that it you know, starts off a year of learning and growth for all of us, and you know, for the artist as well, because it's a weird way for you as an artist to have your work um, exposed to a, a broader audience as well. And um, so thank you for being here. This recording will be available on our um, website. We'll have it on Facebook and uh, on social media. And so you'll be able to go back and watch if there's you know, things that you miss on it that you wanna go back and watch later. So Bill, um, Bill, just to give you a little background on him. Bill, he's an artist and educator. He holds um, uh, an MFA in sculpture from um, his BA from Binghamton University and MA from Louisiana State University. Something fascinating, he lived in Japan um, from 20, 2005 to 2009 and um, was a scholar at Tokyo University of the Arts where he got his MA in wood sculpture, which is a really specific uh, degree. I'd like to hear more about that too. In, from 2009 to 2014, he lived and worked in Rochester, New York, where he taught at the Rochester Institute of Technology and uh, at the University of Rochester. And he's currently the, an associate professor and head of the sculpture program at Salisbury University, where he just built, and we've been watching the past few months as he's built and organized this new sculpture studio there at the school. So I hope we get to hear some more about that as well. So Bill, you wanna take it away? Sure, sure. So, so first of all, thank you, Rena uh, and, and Katie and everybody at the Art League. The, the ALLC is a great um, regional arts center and, it's, and it's, it's, it's a terrific partnership with the university and it's great to see you know, these two organizations working together. There's a lot that, that can happen for the community. So thank you both for that and, and for this opportunity. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna dive in. Um, please, if you have questions, if you have comments as we go, you know, raise your hand or, or, or unmute yourself. I know everybody's muted and everybody has the video off, but you're, you're totally welcome to interject at any point in time. It makes this, um, it makes the experience easier for the presenter uh, um, and better for everybody. So um, yeah, what you're, what you're looking at here are uh, two drawings. And this feels to me like my high watermark is drawing. I, 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 I came from uh, my undergraduate experience. Um, you know, I came from a formal academic figurative drawing perspective and there it is. Um, so I still like these drawings, but I don't make a lot of work like this anymore. Anyway, so that's, that's drawing at Binghamton University. Um, and uh, I, was a, I was an undergraduate um, uh, taking liberal arts classes and sort of all over the place, didn't know what I wanted to do. And at a certain point in time, I went to the, uh, the cloisters uh, which is the Metropolitan Museums of Art Medieval Branch um, in Uptown Manhattan, and uh, completely fell in love with medieval wood carving. Um, and so this this little rosary bead down here, and I'm guessing you guys can see my cursor. 
um, is uh, it's two and an eighth inches in diameter. So it's a, it's a little bit bigger than a golf ball. And it's got you know, 28 figures inside. And I completely fell in love with the idea of somebody devoting that much time and energy to you know, something that was so small and kept closed most of the time. And I spent about two years, um, I actually withdrew from the university and spent a couple of years trying to teach myself this you know, craft of, of wood carving. And I made all these little figured wood carvings and I, and I made dozens of them. Did the arts and crafts fair circuit for a couple of years um, and uh, became proficient in, in working with wood. And uh, then I went back to school and um, spent a couple of years, great years in the studio, um, making work and really formally trying to connect what I had done on my own to more contemporary work. So kind of methodically working through um, 500 years of stylistic art history. And this is sort of a condensed version of that. Um, but the figurative references are still there. I guess that's the point of this. Um, so some bronze casting and more sophisticated wood carvings. Um, this is a little bit bigger and glued up. Uh, this is carved out of a single block. Um, when I went back to school, I had just studio art classes to take except for my art history requirements as I was finishing my BFA. And, and, I, and I took an, uh, an Asian art history survey course um, under the, the idea that like, I would get European art history just as part of what I was doing normally. And I, and I really wanted to try to you know, immerse, expand my, my world, literally. And I, and I completely fell in love with um, medieval, Europe, medieval Japanese wood sculpture. So this is Kamakura period um, Japanese sculpture. And it's built with this process called Yosegi Zukuri, which translates roughly as multiple hollow block construction. So it's logs that are split apart, carved, hollowed out, reassembled, and then surface carved. And you can get, get a sense of, you know, the head is missing from this figure and the, the feet are off. Um, and I looked at it really as state-of-the-art wood carving. You know, it, it's this, you know, very evolved process um, and completely full of movement. So it tied in with a lot of what I was doing. There's some, some more details of work from this period. Still making drawings occasionally, that's occasional. So this is, this is from graduate school. And can I go forward? Okay. Um, so, so these are some kind of early, early attempts at making work that is a little, bit, um, a little bit contemporary and using that multiple hollow block process. Um, in, in this case, it's, you know, it's a single block put together. Um, and there's the art historical reference, right? So I'm looking at these, these giant slit gongs. This, this is in the, um, the Rockefeller wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is great, you know, super diverse work. Um, tying in some political elements. This is right at the time of, right after the, uh, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. Um, and that's a, it's a portrait head of George W. Bush, um, carved, hollow, reassembled with, with that process. Um, and then I, I drove uh, about 15 pounds of rusty drywall screws into it, referring to this style of work from, um, from the Congo. And, and gesture and movement. So this is a show from 2003. Um, I'm skipping a lot of stuff really, really early. So it may, it may look disjointed, but um, I had a summer job around 2000 um, working in a nursing home. I, I was uh, an assistant maintenance person in a nursing home. And, and the experience of, of watching, of, of being the lowest person on the totem pole in the nursing home and being in constant contact with Alzheimer's patients like it left a really deep impression. So these are, these are, it's, it's, the wood is live oak. This is in Louisiana. It's amazingly strong, hard wood, very tough material. And I wanted to make these elegant figures that were suspended and um, in a state of collapse. Click, click, 
through. Okay. Um, and this is my graduate thesis work. So this is, um, I made about 30 of these figures. They're all live oak. Um, and um, uh, there are, I don't know, seven or eight of them that were eight to 10 feet tall and seven or eight of them that were five to six feet tall, and, you know, various sizes. So, and, and it, it completely filled the room. Um, the larger figures, you know, I don't know if you can see the figurative references, but I still kind of feel them, right, from figure drawing. It's still, it's still there, the, the gestures and the movements, which are really inherent to the material. Um, heads have been replaced by these giant open mouths, which I think, okay, that's a, that's a pretty good symbol for um, consumption, for voice. Um, it, it's, it's a good abstraction of the head without the specifics of the head. Um, arms have been replaced really by these kind of pointy spikes, right? And, and, and I'm playing with the idea of um, consumption and aggression being related. Laura, you have a question. You're muted. You're, you... Can you hear me now? Yep. Beautiful work um, and welcome. Um, I'm just curious, are these larger pieces are, is the art of this to do this all by hand or do you use, uh, are you permitted to use certain pieces of machinery? Well, I use whatever pieces of machinery are, machinery are appropriate. The, the first carvings are all by hand, chisel and, and mallet. Um, and these are almost exclusively with a chainsaw. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I use primarily a chainsaw now. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, go back. Okay, so, so this is um, right after graduate school and it's the same themes, right? It's these ideas of, of consumption. There's a, there's, I should have an image in it in here, but I don't. There's a series of scrolls from about the 11th century, the, the high-end period in, in Japan of hungry ghosts, these, um, these um, deities and in a, in a, or, or these uh, individuals in, a, in, in, in hell that are, con they're condemned to hell and they're, they're, the only thing that they can eat is filth basically. And they're, they're, I thought, okay, that's a great symbol of overconsumption, right? These individuals who are, who are condemned and, and I love them, but there's no sculptural representation of them. And I thought, okay, I could take these figures and give them some, some three-dimensional form. So here they are. So this is all, it's all cypress. Um, it's carved, it's hollow. These figures are, if you stood them up, they're about six and a half to seven feet tall. And um, you can pick them up and throw them over your shoulder. And you know, they don't weigh very much at all. Hands are cast copper, some collages on the wall, trying to make things immersive. Um, what I skipped is I spent between 2000 and 2001 in Japan. Um, and as I was finishing graduate school, I applied for the, uh, it's called the Manbukaku Show um, Award. And uh, I got the scholarship to go back to Japan as a postgraduate research student. And I want to go forward. And, uh, and the, so um, in the fall 2005, I, I, I uh, enrolled it as a, as a Ken Kusei, that's a, it's a research student postgraduate research student at the Tokyo University of Fine Arts and Music, um, which was a terrific experience. And, I, and I, so this is, this is the studio as I saw it when I went in. And um, there's one person's workspace, that's my workspace. There's another person's cubicle. So there were about 20 of us working in this room that was roughly the size of a basketball court. Um, everybody worked with camphor. And it, like the smell is overpowering, you know. You know, I, I know it from cough medicine, right? And and lip balm, but the smell is just completely overpowering. Um, and it was a terrific experience. So I went over again. It's 2005, thinking about George Bush, and 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 I'm making you know the most political work that I can. And I feel, still feel pretty good about the composition and design of this thing. But nobody in Japan had any idea what I was reference, referencing. None. I had to explain that the eagle is a symbol of, is a symbol of America, right? In my really really poor broken Japanese. Um, so I felt pretty good about the piece. Um, 
but I pretty immediately decided to stop making work that, that had that kind of um, overt symbolism. And um, uh, over the course of a couple of years, I worked towards this, which, you, which you've seen. Um, so this is called Jonah. Um, the, and, it's, and it's based on an image of a whale. And I don't know if you know that or not, should have an image in here, but um, right, uh, right next to the university in, in Japan, in, in Tokyo, uh, is the National Museum of History. And they have a life-size concrete cast of fiberglass, probably, cast of a blue whale out in front of it in this pose. So like, it was really clear to me, like that gesture. Um, this is built out of a single log. And uh, it was kind of, it was about, uh, I don't know, eight feet long and about three feet in diameter. And that kind of crop forked out into a crotch. So this section here is cut out of the widest part of that crotch where, where, where it wide out and then built back together, coopered back together like you'd build a barrel. And then this section, and I think you can see the seam lines, is um, from the widest diameter of the log. This section back here came out of the inside of this section, like coring an apple. And then this section came out of the inside of that one, right? So it's sort of like a Russian doll unfolding. Um, and part of that is economy. I paid almost $1,000 for this log, right? Wood in, wood in Tokyo is not cheap. Um, and I paid almost $1,000 for this later for this base, this log, a um, little bit less. So a series of drawings, you know, kind of building up towards the, the larger work. And there it is at Ardax in 2019. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to say that the university has purchased this piece and we are, it feels like this close to getting it actually installed on campus. I, like, we, I thought maybe last week and I, now I think maybe, you know, two weeks, but like, we'll get it out there. Um, it is uh, a very, very comfortable place to sit when it is installed on campus, the bench, it'll be a different bench, but you can sit on the bench and recline inside the piece and uh, there's a nice view out. It's a little bit like sitting at a, at a nice comfortable bus stop. Um, I've got a lot of fond memories of building it. So I built this in part, I'm gonna bounce back to this for just a second. I built this in part to um, matriculate into the MA program. Uh, there, the university tradition there is, um, at least in the fine arts, is modeled on the, on the uh, academic Italian French model. And as part of the entrance, you need to submit a single, a single piece of work. So I built this to get into the MA program. Um, and I did, uh, and, it, and it was a terrific experience. So I spent uh, two year, a year and a half as a Ken say, and then two years as a graduate student, um, so three and a half years total at the university. Wonderful, wonderful experience. Highly recommended for, for um, I, tried, I try hard to push students into the similar programs. In uh, 2008, I got invited. We all, we all did an annual exhibition at this building in the background. And this is the, the Hiragushi Denshu studio. Hiragushi Denshu was a, was a um, kind of a, a traditional Japanese wood sculptor. He taught at the university for a few years um, in the 60s, I think. So there's a formal connection. Um, his studio is walking distance from the university in one of the old parts of Tokyo. Beautiful neighborhood and a, and a really beautiful building. It had kind of fallen apart. And we, we, the department restored it and um, had an annual wood sculpture exhibition in it. Um, so I have to a little out of order here. Um, the most, oh, I'm sorry, I'm out of order. The most um, iconic, one of the most iconic public pieces of sculpture in Tokyo are, is the uh, Louise Bourgeois um, Maman. And these are giant spiders. It's a, it's a 30 foot tall steel and bronze spider. 
And um, I wanted to consciously refer to that European modernism alongside the Japanese modernism, which is a, I don't know, is a, is a relatively young person. I thought this is too traditional. Um, so I made this piece that was kind of halfway in between um, Birdhouse. There it is in process in my little tiny studio space off campus. In process. So the, I, I mentioned earlier that I spent uh, a bunch of money on the log that, that Jonah, the big piece, is, is based on. Um, this is from the inside of that log, right? So I cut it again, sort of like cutting the crust off a sandwich. And, and the wood that came out is here. And it's all, you know, there was no round part. This is all coopered back together, again, like building a barrel. And then there's some details of how the joinery is put together. So there's some engineering, some figuring out. I want to just go forward. And this is, this is uh, about the time I'm, I'm leaving Japan. So um, as part of what was essentially my thesis exhibition, um, I know I have a tendency to kind of be all over the place. So I built, I, I spent uh, a winter break coming up with this kind of candle snuffer form, pulled a plaster mold from it, cast a whole bunch of them in wax, um, and then put them back together in different configurations. And one of the configurations is just the, the elements individually is social climbers, right? There's, again, there's the same kind of um, imagery. There's a mouth and there's a really pointy hand. It's hand to mouth, right? There's, a, there's consumption put together in different ways. Um, this is carved. Um, it's about 10 feet long. Um, you know, with a representational hand at the end. This is still in Japan. There it is in process, right? In the, in the shared studio space. I'm sure that I was annoying my studio mates as I was making this. Cause like that's, this is, this guy is now a, a, a he makes traditional dolls in uh, Kyushu and he does really well making these large, clearly I'm encroaching on everybody's space, trying hard not to. But shared space. One of the reasons I'm showing you this is because at the beginning of this process for me, logs are very heavy. And there's a lot of like, how am I gonna get this thing to stand in the way that I want it to be eventually? When like, eventually it's gonna not weigh very much, but for the time being, I gotta, it's gotta be propped up and not fall and crush anybody. So there it is in process. Um, other pieces in process. So these are all based on that single candle snuffer form, right? There's a different, and the models for this, the model for this right now is in, in the Fulton lobby in the glass case. Um, this is a challenge, right? Trying to get this, this is about 10 feet tall and trying to get these forms up in the air when they're very heavy and they're, you know, far enough over my head that I can't put hands on them is a little scary. So it's all built upside down you know, kind of designed like this and then flipped upside down and build, figuring how it's gonna get all bolted together, turn it back upright, you know, take the crane off it, hope it doesn't fall over. Oh, yeah. Same, same basic candle snuffer form with different iterations. Um, furrow and eat the young, trying to like, hands are so expressive, bringing in representational hands, grabbing or crawling or doing whatever they're doing. Um, it's great to work with hands. I'm very proud of this photo. I spent a long time with a tripod and a camera with an extremely slow exposure, waiting for a short woman to walk through. Cause with a, like an eight foot, with a, seven, a six and a half foot tall guy, the pieces look much smaller, so. There it is, very proud of that photo. And there's the work at Ardax last year, right? Um, coming back from Japan, I had an opportunity. It seemed like a good time to do a residency. So I, I, I did a two week residency on the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is an extremely remote place, the UP. Um, so this is in the background of this is uh, Lake Superior. This dark blue is Lake Superior. Um, this uh, spot in the Porcupine Mountains is a ski slope in the winter. Um, and they gave it to me for the summer to build 
this, you know, this temporary uh, structure. And I thought birds and bridges, those are both excellent symbols of transition that I've kind of flirted with in the past. So I built this 80, 80 foot long thing out of logs and branches, um, which is a nice way to work. It's a fun way to work. Um, you know, I came onto this site every morning, bicycled up to it with my little radio so I could listen to Minnesota NPR and my little lunchbox. And I uh, spent the day cutting branches and tying them together uh, or collecting driftwood on the shores of Lake Superior. Nice way to work. Um, and uh, trying to keep connections back in Japan. I had, I had a, a prearranged a gallery exhibition um, in Tokyo um, with this gallery and I thought, okay, birds. Um, and, and they had agreed to pay to ship work from Rochester, New York to, to Tokyo and back. And um, you know, that, which is not cheap. Um, so I needed to come up with, with work that could fill um, what, a, about a 1500 square foot gallery that would also be light enough and inexpensive enough to ship so that they wouldn't hate me. Um, so I, I, and I thought, okay, these, these, these bird forms, there are 30 birds. Um, and if anybody's curious, there's a specific reason why it's 30 birds. And I'll come back to it at the end if we have time, um, but otherwise I'll skip it. Um, they all come apart, the bodies and the legs come apart and they all nest together, no pun intended, and fit into two crates, shipped over and back. Flock. Drawings on the walls. These drawings are very purposefully trying to recall Chinese landscape calligraphy uh, and Chinese landscape ink drawings, which I cannot do, like it's outside of my skill set, but I'm, and I'm not, pretending to, to, to have that skill, but, um, but I, it's trying to stretch the gallery to create context, uh, to create space um, and incorporate the walls. This is a residency. One of, one of, the, great one of the great things about um, being at the University of Japan with the other foreign students. So I, you know, I, I've got friends and colleagues in Bosnia and Iran in China. This is uh, one of my colleagues who, after she left, she got a, a job, she's Taiwanese, she got a job teaching at uh, the uh, National Donghua University in Hualien, and she organized a symposium and invited a bunch of us to the, the symposium. So I spent a week at that university making this piece, and um, she had, we had arranged for her to have a chainsaw for me in wood, like all by email with a 12-hour time delay, and I showed up, and the chainsaw was, um, it had a 25 inch bar on it. Like it would have been great for cutting down a forest of trees, but for like what I do, it's completely inappropriate. And uh, the wood was all old student work that was full of nails and wire and been taken apart, completely unusable. Um, so, I, so I did what I did in Michigan and I spent the first mornings with jet lag going into the woods behind the, the university and collecting branches and um, and then it's all like built with, to, to Laura's question earlier, it's all built really with a, with a light, a small light chainsaw that I scrounged from someplace and a spoke shape, draw knives. Um, it's all tied together. It was a great experience. Formosan magpie is the national, is the national bird of Taiwan. Um, okay, and this is, this is like settling into my studio back in, in the US in 2010. Um, and this was in front of the Art League, so some of you guys are familiar with it, but the, um, um, it's that same candle snuffer form. Here there are four of them put together, but it's that same shape. There's the little model for it. Um, still like this piece a lot. That's in storage. Um, hands and mouths in different iterations. Right. There are the birds in the background. Incorporated. This is sort of my my interpretation. Like twelve people together. That's you know twelve sets of hands and one sets of mouth. Seven people. Um, one of the one of the um, I love working with wood on a large scale, but it's impractical. Like it's, it takes up storage space. Even when things come apart, it's hard to show. Like I have to drive work and assemble it myself. I can't really ship things in crates with with the full scale stuff. So. Um, there's a little bit, this is a little bit of publisher parish, um, and, uh, I'm making work 
there's a little bit of publishing, like I need to show work. I need to have exhibitions as I'm looking for a, for a tenure track teaching job. Um, and I'm trying to like exercise some other skills. I'm, I'm a good metal caster. So there's a cast iron here. Um, and trying to make work that is maybe a little bit more identifiable, a little bit less abstract. So bringing in animal references. So all those things are at play. Um, and I'm very, you know, thinking about uh, the marquee endangered animals, you know, elephants and rhinoceroses. And there's, there's the, the harsh reality that like, I'm very skeptical that when my children are my age, that there will be elephants in the wild or, you know, or that, that will they, stay? it's a question, right? Or, or the generation after that, at a certain point, you know, there's a lot of threats. So I'm trying to play with, with that series of, of animals. Um, again, tying in consumption, um, formally, you know, stealing from others, which, which every artist does. These drawings are Heinrich Clay. And if you don't know his pen and ink drawings and you're a drawer, and I'm, I'm guessing some of the art league people are, are drawers, um, you should look at Heinrich Clay. He was the person that Walt Disney um, uh, emulated. He worked, they worked together for a little while. And then Walt Disney, there's clearly the influence with these dancing elephants, but beautiful pen and ink drawings and really strong social satire. Heinrich Clay. Um, Ernst Barlock down here, you know, and I, I, there's a rhinoceros and I think, okay, rhinoceros, they move forward. That's what they do. And I thought of this piece of sculpture that I, I love, Barlock. And, I, and so, okay, how can I take elements from that gesture and that style of movement and incorporate it into my work? So charge came from that, cast bronze and cast iron. This is one of the first pieces of, of iron that was cast at the university in Salzburg for what that's worth. Um, there is a full-size version of it. This is carved in maple. Um, it's about five feet long and, and doesn't weigh very much. Um, this, it, again, it's a wood carving. This is, this is a maple tree that um, I did at one point when I was in Rochester tap to make uh, maple syrup from this tree. And then the city came through and they cut down limbs for power lines and I scrounged the limbs and it's all built from that. Maple finished with aluminum leaf and um, graphite to kind of complicate the surface, drawing marks, collage, those kinds of things. Uh, question, right, there's a chimpanzee. This is gonna be at the uh, Rehoboth Art League um, in May along in a show called Makers and Mentors, which will be faculty and former students. And I should have an image of my former students work in here. I'll put it in next time, but go see that show. Um, it's, it's, it's Heidi Rotman and they're like chimpanzees with these crazy hands. It's really fun work. Um, this, I, this is shipped back to that, um, the Hiragushi Denshi show, which was annually, done annually. So I shipped this back to Tokyo. There's a gibbon falling through space. You know, and you can't reference an ape um, falling through space without thinking about King Kong, or I can't at least. So there it is. That's butter, butternut, and the carving is only about 10 inches long. It's pretty small. Uh, attrition, this is cast iron, cast at the university. Um, this is modeled, it looks like a dog. It looked like my Australian cattle dog, but it's modeled on the, um, the Eastern Red Wolf, uh, which I think there are red wolves at the Salisbury Zoo, but that's, that's now a, a threatened or endangered species. Um, and was the wolf that was indigenous to, to Delmarva. Um, incomplete, fragmentary, right? So the casting, I didn't mention this earlier, the casting flaws are left on purpose, these voids. Yeah, it's threatened. Vanish. This was at the Art League. Um, cast bronze. Um, okay, so this is this is a collaborative piece um, with uh, from the uh, folk festival. Um, we did this for the piece on the upper left for five hundred dollars. I built the models for it, and then I, I built it with uh, Margie Barnes and um, uh, I'm blanking on his last name, Kevin. Um, 
why can't I think of his last name, who runs the, the makerspace and so M4, the makerspace in Salisbury. Um, he did the lights, she did the reflective stuff and the, and the cutting with CNC. I did the model and did a lot of the figuring out. We installed this after dark, the night before the festival was to open, pouring concrete. We backed Margie's van underneath it. I stood on the hood of the, on the roof of the van to hold it in place, stupid installation, <laughs> but fun. Um, and I've got these, all these little bronzes that sooner or later I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna make some, some five foot tall bronze casts of these types of forms. Same kinds of gestures, pointy hands, movement in different directions. I hope you can see the references to earlier work. Um, my squirrel bomb. <laughs> this, this is a series of pieces that I make every once in a while um, that I think of as weapons for frustrated pacifists. As a, as a 30 year vegetarian and a pacifist, um, we still get frustrated. <laughs> we still want to drop bombs. I, I love the idea of being able to inflict 20 squirrels on my neighbor. <laughs> So I made, a, I made a cast iron squirrel bomb. Um, I'm very happy with this. Um, Koyana Scotsi. I don't know if anybody has seen Koyana Scotsi, but it's this beautiful film in stop at, um, in uh, um, this beautiful film dealing with life out of control, life out of balance, right? Godfrey Reggio. Um, it's a Hopi Indian wor word that means life out of balance. Right, so Koyana Scotsi, and it and it begins with an image of a of a um, uh, of an Atlas rocket taking off um, in slow motion, and it ends with a beautiful, beautiful shot of a um, an it's a different rocket, but it but a uh, an exploded rocket booster falling and tumbling through space for three minutes, and it lights and it it's just gorgeous with Philip Glass music in the background. And um, so I made, I, I thought, okay, it's a beautiful image. Um, and, I, and I wanted to impress on my students in 2014 that they could make work quickly. Um, so I took some uh, styrofoam backer rod, which is the stuff that you caulk windows and doors with. And I tied it into knots and I put, buried it in sand and I poured aluminum on top of it. And uh, it took 20 minutes to make the form for this and then 10 minutes to cast it in aluminum. And, maybe an hour to clean it up and tint it with oil paint. And I made all this series of work for a single critique, just kind of as a way to say to my students, you can make more work faster. Jennifer, I'm talking to you just a little bit. Um, and Madison, if you're, my, if, if you're Madison Andrews, you, you know this. Thanks for calling me out on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not calling you out. You make work, you make work quickly. In, in Madison, you did too. You guys both know this, but it's a but it's it a doesn't good, feel fast. <laughs> it's a good thing to it's a good thing to remind yourself of to change your pace once in a while. Right. right. Um, so 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 this is this is several iterations further on. These are cast iron. Um, and it's the same kind of idea. These create these really complicated forms. And I started to think of this as um, is great metaphors for complex systems breaking down, you know, and in 2017 that like, I can see that tying in in a political way and an environmental way and a societal way. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different tie-ins for that metaphor, I think. Um, and I think that they're, you know, they're nice graceful pieces. The basis, the basis for these pieces, just so you know, came from a tree that I picked up in the parking lot of the Lowe's in North Salisbury. They cut down a bunch of oaks and I'm like, oh, I'm take one of those logs. Um, really pretty wood. Um, and there's a full-size carved version of it. So this is sassafras and silver leaf. This is in my backyard. Um, dissolution, right? Dissolving forms, complex systems breaking down. And there's different, you know, I think there, I can see different, as I'm developing these things, you think of different gestural references that tie in. This always feels like, well, I'll, I won't go on. Um, so there are different kind of dancer references tied in. Um, drawings in the background, the same kind of, that's um, oil stick on uh, aluminum leaf, or I'm sorry, oil stick on aluminum foil. And as far as I can tell, aluminum foil is just thick, cheap aluminum leaf. 
same idea, the creative act, right? And drawing some background. Um, this is at the our, we're home with our league, 2019. Bigger pieces. Um, I was moving this around yesterday. I, I'm, I'm very happy with this piece, and I, I had made the kind of the decision to not um, make it in components because, like, that creates its own set of hassles. Um, and I'm paying for that. Last night, I was rearranging my storage at home, thinking about the show in July a little bit. And um, it's a hassle to move this thing around. <laughs> um, it catches on everything. Um, it's hollow. It's carved in multiple parts. Um, it's cherry on a formal steel base. Same idea, but trying to bring in some specific references. So seven small hands. These hands are all modeled after my kids' hands. So they're, they're child size. And I think both of these pieces have been in faculty shows. So some of you have seen them at the RAL. Against the Ruin. Against the Ruin and the Creative Act are both uh, from a quote that I think shows up at the end of this. There it is, the show coming down. I am a lot less. I, I took work down from the faculty, the current faculty show last night. And um, I am aware that I am a lot more casual than anybody else that I know as far as packing stuff. But I don't know how else to pack this stuff. You know, you just have to keep it from moving and a little bit of padding between it sometimes. But like, otherwise they'd be in, you know, $15,000 worth of crates and it would take a full size 21 foot truck to move them. Um, but nothing broke between on, on the rainy day between the RAL and Salisbury. Okay, so as that show was ending, um, I had two uh, mature oak trees taken down in my backyard. So this is, this is my backyard, which was the first time ever that I've had the experience of having a full tree carcass to work with um, and think about before cutting it up. You know, fairly often I have a, a student or a friend or colleague that says, hey, I got a tree, you know, or there's a tree down. And like I have a day to get it before they cut it up to get rid of it or a week or something like that. But in this case, I had about six months to live with it and think, you know, go out with chalk and draw on it and think, okay, how can I butcher this thing in a way that I can put back together um, and make good use out of. And I looked at the trees and I thought, okay, I have four pieces of sculpture there, but I'm not sure which ones. Um, same time, we had two maples taken down in our front yard. So those are the maples. Um, the oak limbs are much stronger than the maple limbs are. It's a stronger wood as a rule. So I, I got rid of the limbs for the maple pretty much right away. They became firewood. Um, and there are, there are the oak limbs. Um, so this is, this is in process. I just made all those, you know, the twisty knotty pieces and I've been making the animal pieces pieces before that and the, uh, you know, the, the big weird wood pieces. And I wanted to make some big weird wood pieces that had figurative gestures or figurative elements in it. Because I haven't made figurative work in a long time, but I don't want to make carved faces ever again because it's, you know, it's so much time for so little work. I have thought about making a, a Trump piece that was similar to the George piece, but the Bush piece, but, you know, I, I just don't want to spend the time doing it. Um, so the heads are replaced with these anonymous mouths. And I thought, okay, I've got an anonymous head on a human body and animal references, and that's a sphinx. Okay, that's a good reference to draw from. Um, formally, the challenge for me is how can I make this weird shape and pick it up off the ground without tying it to the ceiling or putting it on a visible stand, right? So the arms support it like a gymnast. Um, and that, um, you know, felt really good. So there it is in process. Carve those hands and, you know, those hands just don't meet. They're not up to snuff. They don't, they don't really match. Um, but so I picked it up in space. Okay. If once you're going to pick some, this is again for the students and for everybody else, it's a functional artist. If you're going to do something and like go through the effort of picking something up into space, the difference between having it a foot off the ground and having it four feet off the ground there's no difference. So like pick it up so that it, you know, instead of me being at eye level with this thing, now at this height, it towers over me, right? And it changes the way that you read pieces and the way that it influences the gallery. 
So I pick that up. And then um, there's the there's the recarved hands, you know, getting rid of those uh, wooden boxes. And what I'm about there now, so it's it's appropriately intimidating. Um, there it is, and there it is at the faculty show. It just came up. Um, there's the birdhouse again. I love this piece, and and this is one of the first pieces that I sold as an adult for a real price, and so I I have a special. And it's next to, um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. It's next to the Madison, you probably know this. It's next to the same guy who did the hammering man that's in front of the Seattle Art Museum, Jonathan Borofsky, Jonathan Borofsky. It's in the collector's home next to the Jonathan Borofsky. So that, that's, a, that's a professional high watermark. Um, there's the Maman, which should have been earlier in the presentation, sorry. The punk hills. So I wanted to go back to that piece formally. And um, I had these lit logs in the background. So here it is in process. Um, and I want, I, I'm not trying to recreate Louise Bourgeois work. I'm coming from a completely different perspective, but I like the formal challenge and I like the image and I have history with this thing from 14 years ago. Um, there is a progress. Um, and I co completely fell in love with this gesture. I love this thing at that state. Um, but it's not going to stand up. So I made a different iteration of it with a tripod. This log, this log up here is this log down here, right? So it's still pretty heavy at that rough in state, trying to figure it out, propped up. Um, there it is a little further along, a little bit further along. And I, it, in this by itself is boring. So there's, a, there's now a structure that branches off the back. And this is the beginnings of that structure that branch off the back. These logs that have grain that matches, right, with that crotch. So it's they're sort of like wings, and they're built as wings. Oops. Um, and it's finished now, but I don't have an image of it. So there's the there's the the birdhouse um, further along, right? It's the weight is supported by the crane. And these logs are about 11 feet long at this state. They're from the limb, or I'm sorry, these limbs. They're from that oak tree in the backyard. Um, you know, I've got all the stuff that is complicated, done and carved in wood first, suspended. And um, it took a long time to level out the bottoms of those six so that they're all at the right length. There it is a little bit further along once they're all carved. Again, Laura, to your, to your question from earlier, this was entirely chainsaw to this point. There it is almost complete. The only thing that's left is the hand at the bottom and one single hand felt really dumb. So I, so I thought, okay, formally, I just need to complete this thing. So I went back to the, to the knot work and uh, carved it as a knot. Right, so there it is complete with uh, just a knot carved at the end. Feels like a nice way to tie off the end of the thing. And the knot is a good reference to hands, right? You can't tie knots without your hands. They're good stand-ins and surrogates for that. There it is complete. There it is in the faculty show. Um, and I took this, put this in my truck yesterday, brought it home. And this is it. This is, uh, so... So this is the, the PR piece. And there's that quote that I referred to, right? The two titles. So Against the Ruin is a title of a piece and the Creative Act is, a, is a, one of the pieces. Um, I love that quote, right? And, I, and I, th I thought it was worthwhile enough to stick it on the, above the door in my studio. So I see it all the time. It's a good reminder on bleak days that um, like, you know, just making stuff feels good. Um, that's all I've got. Wow, Bill, I, uh, I just want to say that seeing the delicacy of your work, but then also the scale of your work and how you um, construct it, because I mean, I've seen the work before, but I never realized how you actually did it. But then realizing how it looks in the space of a room with a lot of pieces together, and um, uh, it is just really, it's a, uh, it's been really great to see it. Thank you so much for presenting it and showing it that way. 
I'll never look at one of your sculptures again <laughs> the same now knowing how how you make it and and then um, you know also appreciating the fact of the balance of it you know that a lot of things are so, are so heavy on the top and so delicate on the bottom and the gestural nature of it yeah thanks that's that's fun I I, I um you know it's pedestals try to get get away from formal pedestals like these white boxes like how can I you know surrogate substitute something that's you know contributes to the work and get stuff up in, in there it's a good formal challenge um, questions from anybody? Hey Bill, uh, Mike Lindley here. Uh, can, you see, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a little muffled, but I can I can make it out. Okay. Um, yeah, I've always been intrigued by uh, the few pieces that I've seen that you've done, so I really appreciate uh, you know your, your talk this morning and seeing the work and the evolution. It's really fascinating. I, I think. You know, in my world as an architect, uh, you know, we deal with wood that's uh, you know, naturally a tree is very organic, and uh, but in our world, it's converted to something very rectilinear and you know, work of graphic. And, it's, uh, and, and so I'm fascinated by much more organic pieces that come out. Uh, George Nakashima is somebody of interest to me. Of course, that work is very functional, being furniture, but it's still you know, going in a more organic direction. And it's, it's just really fascinating to see what you've been able to do uh, over your career and the type of work that you've done. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, first of all, your passion for wood? And have you always seen it as a finished product? And, you know, a lot of your pieces look like they could easily be cast, and I think some of them have been based on what you've shown. But, but the, if you could speak to the wood aspect of it, um, I think I, I gleaned from your talk that a lot of it. Is done with chainsaw, but is there any more finished work that you use any machinery uh, or is it all hand tools? How, how do you get down to the detail? Or, or is it all chainsaw? I'd really be fascinated to hear it. I'm fascinated to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can. I can. I, if if I um, if I don't answer the question completely, it's it's it, it, it's a little muffled on on my end. But I but um, I could talk about wood and, and tools a little bit. Um, so. Uh, I talked. I mentioned the cloisters right at the beginning of the talk, and the, those little rosary beads. At the same time, um, um, I, I was reading Narcissus and Goldman, which is Herman Hesse about a uh, medieval woodcarver. Um, and so there's a, and I haven't read it. I haven't gone back to it in a long time. Um, but those two kind of romantic notions went together. Um, and I was doing a lot of backpacking, right? So like, I, I'm an outdoors guy, and I love trees, um, and I have. You know, my love for trees has developed and grown along with the, the love for wood. Um, wood is flesh, right? It's a living thing. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think periodically about other materials that other um, artists use and like wood, wood, I mean, such a wonderful material. It, it's completely sustainable. It comes in great shapes. It comes in different flavors, um, smells and textures. Um, it's, it's been used by every culture that has access to it from the beginning. So there's like, it's part of human history. Um, and there, you know, it's living material. Uh, uh, so yeah. And the, and the more, the, if you like it, and if you like working with wood, I think this is probably true from all of all wood, woodworkers that I know, the more time that you spend with it, the more you get intoxicated with it. <laughs> Um, so it's kind of a cumulative thing. Um, it has, you, you notice that it, it has um, challenges that like I may find, you may find a great crotch or a great piece of tree with a, with a branch or whatever, and you start to cut into it and um, like there's an animal living inside it. That happens, um, you know, not mammals, but you, insects, grubs all the time. My oak, my, my oak limbs, I kept having this issue with uh, spiny oak borers. There are these awful borers. They're like two and a half inches long. And I kept finding them in, in their state as I was carving through the chains uh, and uh, killing them or feeding them to my chickens. Um, so, and, and then wood changes shape and size all the time. Right, it, it, as it absorbs moisture, it expands, as it loses moisture, it contracts, and this is a seasonal thing. 
Um, so like joints have to be designed with that in mind. Um, and that contributed to the aesthetic quality. The very, I think the third slide in this presentation is an image, has an image of kind of a wavy ribbon shaped piece. And that was an early strategy for me to keep it from checking and checking are the cracks that develop along the grain um, by making it thin quickly um, and, and allowing the water to, the moisture to leave the wood from both directions. Um, there's some furniture making that I've picked up as I, as I go. Um, uh, I'm not trained in any way as an architect. Right, um, but there's a lot. There's a lot of, as you you referred, I think there's a lot of common ground, except I'm completely and totally shooting from the hip, and just guessing a lot of the time and hoping things don't fall over, which I guess you can't do, you know, with buildings. Um, uh, I have this uh, image of you just having this sort of secretive dialogue with your tree as you're carving it all along, and I'm, I've got to assume that. Uh, the tree itself influences your work. I'm sure you have sort of a direction in mind, uh, but but does it just sort of evolve organically as you get deeper and deeper into the into the piece? Yeah, that's a that's a pretty accurate assessment. Um, so I like you, sculptors when you're collecting materials. Um, um, I think of it as a bone pile, right? They've got this pile of shapes that I can, or, or it's a toolbox or a toy box or whatever box of Legos. So I have these organic shapes that I can pull from. And they're like at home, they're sort of sorted by, you know, curvy limbs, straight limbs, sorted by species. Cause I don't, I don't really like to mix species except for, for color. Um, so you, you keep those parts and then, and then I, and I design with gesture and movement in mind um, and rough composition. And then compositions are refined as they go. With, with the piece that's still up on the screen, this, this maple, um, uh, piece. The, these. This is all coopered together. So this is larger in diameter than the, the maple that came down in front of my house was. Um, but I knew I was going to do that. So I, I, it's almost four feet in diameter and the maple was a little bit less than three. Um, there's one long limb. And then the hands are carved from crotch. So I had the grain and then another block glued on so that I had mass on both sides. So there's, a, there's some give and take. Um, as far as the dialogue goes, there's a literal dialogue. It's one of the things that happens when you work with a chainsaw and ear protection on is that you get in the habit of talking to yourself out loud because you can't hear anything. Um, so you know the, that dialogue changes and sometimes it's coaxing and sometimes it's swearing and sometimes it's, it's a nice dialogue. And then, and then like when you're carving, you, you still talk to it, but you talk to it in sweeter tones because um, it can hear you, I guess, hand carving. Very good, thank you. Sure. So Bill, um, just briefly to wrap mm -hmm. it up, I'd, I'd love you to just say a few words, something about the new studio at Salisbury University that you've been working on and then also what we can expect in the upcoming year um, with this fellowship some of the projects that you know um, you're going to be working on putting for the right like yeah so so um, COVID, the pandemic will influence that of course um, what we have talked about and um, what, what we've talked about doing is a is a well first the easy things. The exhibition will happen pretty much as, as planned in July. Um, we are very much hoping to do a, um, a, a student exhibition as part of Ardex as we've done in the past. And um, we're working hard to make that possible. So that, let me talk about the space a, a little bit first and then the pandemic. So there, the two, there are two giant sets of variables. One of them is the physical space, which is wonderful and, and um, we have been uh, using it for classes since the third week of, of the semester. I am still moving in, so I don't know where anything is really, I know generally where things are kept, but we haven't labeled shelves, and I, I like an organized studio. Um, all semester long, as I have been introducing a project, I introduce the project, and then I'm scurrying to make sure that the equipment is there and set up for it, right, for each component of each project. So um, 
I didn't, I should have started this off by thanking Chris Egan and everybody at the school and everybody at the university for being, for, you know, for this building, I guess, and for expanding the program, which is great. And like, we're growing into it now. Um, so yeah, I really am very thankful for that. Specifically, as far as the um, space goes and the exhibition, we are the contractors, the Rommel construction right now is today they're finishing plumbing in the um, burners for our burnout kiln so that we can do, so that we can burn out molds and do lost wax casting, which is the traditional way that bronze casting gets done. And it's the way that it's taught at universities. The kiln is still being built and I'm planning on like, I had I've got a student worker who's gonna be here on Sunday working on it and I'll work with him and I hope that we're done um, uh, for Jennifer's class on Tuesday when they when we make molds that go into the kiln to get melted out. So it's very, it's a little touch and go. Um, um, we'll make it work, but it's a little touch and go. We have our brand new melting furnace, which has never been fired yet. We're, we're figuring out some electrical issue with that and building the foundry as we go. So it's a great space. And it'll take us a year or two to kind of get up to speed in it. Um, but I'm very optimistic that we will have a body of work, student, a body of student work, and some of it, and there's a lot of terrific pieces, which right now are just, they're waxes. So you do a wax and then it, you make a plaster mold and then the wax gets melted out and then the bronze gets poured into it. So it'll be a little while before we have completed castings. Um, those are planned to go to the Salisbury City Park Zoo first is, is a public show um, in May. And we're talking about the dates for that right now. And then that same body of work, hopefully plus more, will go to Ardex in August. So that's, those are two concrete things, my show and then the, the student show will happen as that. Um, hopefully we can put out a, a call for entries as, we, as we've done in the past with Ardex for, for student. And, and recent alumni, Madison, looking at you, involvement for um, like Heidi's hanging snakes from the trees. Um, you know, that's, it, it's great to get, um, to keep connections going. Um, and it's a great opportunity. So my show in Ardex, those are, those are gonna happen. Mm -hmm. we, along, oh, yeah. with, along with the, the, uh, the summer camps, um, um, I, I need to get response to, to Casey Mead's e email um, about setting up the time and, and setting up dates and specifics for that. But we, I'm looking forward to working with kids to, to pull molds of their hands and then we can paint on them or, or do sculpture on them with clay and cast them in plaster and all kinds of different possibilities there. Um, but we'll see what comes of that. Um, we look forward to seeing your work you know, here and out in other exhibits you mentioned that you have, you know, coming up and, and the work of your students because uh, we really enjoy um, seeing the growth, you know, and it adds so much um, to the um, space and the outdoor spaces um, as well. So thank you for sharing with us and, and for, uh, you know, engaging in this fellowship this year. Because it's always, like I said, a journey and each fellow kind of tailors its own. I hope we get to have some, you know, more talks, lectures like this. I think it was very um, educational, really beneficial. This is, like you assume that everybody knows what you do because you've been doing it so long, but sure. the average person doesn't really know how it's constructed or what's behind it. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to share. Um, um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed this and looking forward very much to, to what happens this summer and a workshop, right? We're, we're yeah. gonna- Yeah, we're, and uh, so I just um, welcome everybody to keep uh, posted on, uh, check our website, artleagueofoceancity.org. If you're not a member, um, join the Art League. There's lots of benefits to membership and then you'll stay informed of what's going on. And then um, to watch out on social media as well on the Art League's pages. And I also, we try to share when Bill posts what's going on with his studio in at the university, um, because that's been a fascinating process, just watching that being constructed um, to you know, catch up with us on social media too. So 
Yeah, hopefully, hopefully sometime before the year is out, we can, um, you know, open it up to the public and get people here. Mm, great. That's, that's the one little, little drawback caveat to the space is that we're isolated. Um, and it's, you know, it's nice to have people come through. Mm -hmm. will be nice. All right. So thanks everybody for joining us today um, here and those that will see this later online. Um, and have a great day and just do a little uh, a little shout out coffee with with Bill. So appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you.